Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Please say hi in the chat box and let us know where you're uh, joining us from. Great, we've got people joining us from all over the place. Fantastic. Oh wow. Thanks so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you've got to be a speed reader to keep up with the chat box. I know. Incredible. Yeah, welcome everybody. Great to have you all joining us this afternoon. Can I just check, Kate, can, um, Chris, can you hear me? Yep. Great. <laughs> just in the nick of time, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> welcome everybody. Thank you. So people are joining from all over the country. It's wonderful. Anybody um, joining us from outside Australia? More importantly, anyone from Tasmania. <laughs> hey, someone's from China. Fantastic. I'm from China, welcome. <laughs> so just as people are joining, I'm going to be launching a poll now and we'd love to get your answers to this and we will use it for a platform of discussion a little bit later on. So I'm just going to launch this poll now. So welcome as you join us. Please feel free to respond to the poll that I've just posted. Great. Thank you, everybody, for responding to the poll. That's fantastic. Look at those numbers coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's, so there's some people that can't see the poll. Kate, I'm not sure if you can assist in the chat box with people having any technical problems with seeing the poll. So it looks like about half and half. Some people are, are responding to the poll and some people can't see it. I'm not sure if that might be about the version of Zoom that you have. Um, sometimes if you don't have the latest version of Zoom, some of the newer features don't work. But if you can see the poll, please um, answer it. And if you can't, I'm sorry. Oh, someone's saying it's sitting behind the chat box. So um, maybe move, your, move around some of the things that you have on the screen and you might be able to see the poll. Great. Well, we've got lots of people who have voted. All the people that were able to see it have voted. I might finish that now and um, we will get started in a moment. It looks like if you join through the browser, you might not be able to access the poll. So thank you for letting us know that. We seem to be learning new things all the time about this technology. So I'm just going to end that poll now and we will refer to it a little bit later on. Thank you, everybody. Someone wants to know what the rest of my t-shirt says, so here we go. <laughs> yes. I love that t-shirt. <laughs> Fantastic. There we go. Yep. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. So thank you for joining us in this webinar series, Expert Insights for Workplace. My name is Chris Kafer and I'll be your moderator today. I'm a clinical psychologist and part of the education team at the Black Dog Institute. I help develop and facilitate programs for workplaces and health professionals. And I'm really excited to be part of this discussion today because resilience is a, such an interesting topic and so relevant. As we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're all joining from today. For me, it's the Awabakal people as I'm joining you from Newcastle. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us here today. So we all know that COVID has prompted workplaces to rapidly change and reassess the way that they work. And this change, along with job uncertainty, is causing understandable concern and anxiety among workplaces at all levels. 
the current crisis has presented businesses and leaders with new challenges in responding to employee wellbeing from managing employees who are working at home to standing down staff and also working out how do we now re-enter the workplace as the restrictions start to change. And this webinar series is in response to the workplaces who have contacted us for assistance during this period. It's an opportunity for organisations to ask the burning questions they have, to listen to expert advice from our researchers and to hear strategies that other organisations are implementing. Today we're going to be focusing on building your team's resilience to cope with change and uncertainty. Then it'll also be relevant for other periods of uncertainty and change. So let me introduce you to our panel of experts. With me today is Dr. Saif Joyce, a senior psychologist and researcher in the field of resilience. She's part of the Black Dog Institute's workplace mental health research team and the developer of the online resilience training program, Raw Mind Coach. Saif has used this program with organisations including New South Wales Ambulance, Fire and Rescue New South Wales, Reuters, Corrective Services New South Wales, Ambulance Victoria and many other workplaces. Welcome, Saif. Thanks so much, Chris. Delighted to be here. Fantastic. And let me also introduce you to Dean Yates. Um, until recently, Dean was Head of Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy with the international news agency Reuters. In this role, he raised awareness and reduced stigma, trained managers on how to look after their team's mental health, and was a champion of building resilience. Prior to this, Dean was a journalist, bureau chief and senior editor. His experiences included covering the Bali bombings, the Boxing Day tsunami and Iraq, and he's writing about his experiences in a memoir. Welcome, Dean. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, Dean, in this fantastic T-shirt. <laughs> so, look, these are the discussion topics that we are hoping to cover today, and we're hoping they're of interest to you. We've had some questions that have come through when you registered for the webinar, and we'll be trying to cover as many of those as possible. If you have additional questions, you can pop them in the chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can, but with um, 285 participants, we may not get to all of your questions. If any of your questions are more relevant for a, another webinar that we know is coming up in the series, we may hold those questions until then, but we'll get to as many as we can. So how about we get started and let's define what's resilience. What are we talking about here? Sai, do you want to get us started? On my absolute favourite topic. <laughs> <laughs> So I've spent probably the last five or six years researching resilience in depth at the Black Dog Institute and the University of New South Wales. And one of the first things that really struck me when I was looking at this topic was the competing definitions for this construct, this idea of resilience. There are just so many different um, descriptives out there. But what the research is telling us at this point in time is that resilience really reflects our ability to adapt effectively as human beings in the face of adversity, when we are faced with really challenging situations and when we're faced with uncertainty. So right now, at this point in time, while we're still as, as, a, as a race effectively facing this pandemic, our resiliency has been tested undoubtedly. But there are still a lot of myths about resilience. And this is something Dean and I often talk about when we're having chats together. One of the biggest myths about resilience that seems to still dominate uh, in our society uh, is this idea that resilience means being tough and being able to move through the world unscathed by life's ups and downs. And that kind of comes from a lot of the early research that just viewed resilience as this kind of rare quality that certain people had to be able to deal with really intense situations. Whereas we now know it's far more complex than that. And in fact, we can bolster and develop our resilience over time by learning different skills and strategies and keeping those um, practices um, as a regular part of our daily life. Fantastic. And Dean, what does it mean to you? So that's more the research definition. What's your own lived experience definition? I mean, to me, for me, resilience has, has meant looking after myself. It's meant making uh, self-care my, my number one priority. Um, the most important thing in my life is my family. But for them to get the best of me, I have to look after myself. 
And if I do, then they get the best of me. Uh, otherwise, um, I end up in the psych ward. It's as simple as that. Uh, the, the folks at the start wouldn't have read this on the, the introduction, but I've had three admissions to a psychiatric ward to treat my post-traumatic stress disorder. And if I, if I don't maintain my resilience, if I don't build my resilience, if I don't look after myself, I end up in the psych ward. It's as simple as that. So um, that's what it means for me. Yeah, yeah. And so as we think about, you know, how workplaces are so profoundly impacted by COVID-19, how can resilience be of help now? Is it only going to be helpful for people who have invested in their resilience and, and have high levels of resilience? I would say, to be honest, anyone would benefit from resilience training, particularly now, because we're facing so many um, changes every day with this pandemic and life in itself, you know, just being a human being can be actually quite tough. Sometimes we just face the regular ups and downs of daily life can be quite challenging. So what we know from the research is that resilience training that's currently out there and has been tested through um, effective trials that we know that it's being informed by the psychological research. So the skills that you learn in resilience training often involve some, you know, the best evidence actually currently exists for training programs that combine mindfulness training, and a lot of people be aware of mindfulness and its benefits, but also cognitive strategies. How, we, how do we interact with our inner world of thoughts and emotions? And how do we really look after ourselves when we are struggling with difficult emotions. And this also brings up um, some of the other strategies that are often taught in effective resilience training programs really emphasize self-care, which is what Dean is talking about there. How, how do we know what truly fills our cup as human beings? And how do we actually replenish those resilience resources? Because we know resilience actually can fluctuate over time, particularly after periods of prolonged stress. So there's an element of um, you know, inner strength, really, I think that can be gained from knowing that, oh, if I understand what actually fills my cup and what replenishes my resources, now I kind of have a plan moving forward to bolster my resilience and manage these challenging times um, in an effective way. Yeah, and, and what, what is the evidence about um, how this works, say, at a workplace level? at a workplace level. So our research at the Black Dog Institute, essentially we published back in 2018 a meta-analysis and a systematic review that looked at all the current research studies out there that examined can you enhance resilience. And what we found was that the best evidence exists for programs that really teach mindfulness based um, training, along with these cognitive skills and strategies, which I can explain in a, in a moment. But what we know is that when people are taught this over time, it bolsters their ability to adapt well to challenging situations. And so it also can enhance a number of other what we call resilience related resources. So after we gathered that information, we actually developed a pilot program where we were teaching mindfulness training, teaching these cognitive skills, so these skills that allow us to step back from thoughts that are unhelpful to us and to gain perspective and then refocus our attention. But we also focused on a number of other interesting resilience resources that have emerged through a lot of the literature over the last 10 years. So little practices that may bolster optimism because optimism is considered a resilience resource. Skills that foster self-compassion, which is a really interesting skill and practice, but um, as human beings, it may not come naturally to us to actually foster that sense of care towards ourselves when we're dealing with challenging emotions and thoughts. So our pilot program involved a number of these different strategies. We put it completely online because we wanted to see, can we teach these skills in an online format that can reach um, workers who are geographically dispersed? And I was lucky enough to work very closely with Fire and Rescue New South Wales, because we also knew these were a group of workers who experienced quite a lot of stress in their daily life. It can almost feel commonplace to them because they're so used to being firefighters, but um, for the average human being, that can be quite a lot of stress, and they're also exposed to potentially traumatic events. So being able to trial this program with a group of workers that we know experience stress allows us to see, well, does this actually work? And we gathered data at the beginning, 
of the, um, just before they started their training and afterwards when we had a control group. And what our research found was at six months follow-up, we found a significant increase in adaptive resilience, as well as increases in these resilience resources, such as mindfulness and optimism, and this was one of my favorite findings. We, we found that the fireys, the firefighters who completed our training were much more likely to reach out for support from others when they needed it most, really practical, asking for really practical advice and insight. And that is actually also a resilience skill, being able to reach out for support when we need it most. Can be a little bit of a tricky one for us to lean into as human beings, but it's such a, a powerful practice. I think it's it's good hearing how you've trialled this, you know, kind of the pointy end of professions where people are being exposed to potential trauma because, you know, with COVID, a lot of people who are working in jobs where that was never part of their, their job description before have felt like they've been placed in frontline positions and, and felt like they've been exposed to risks that weren't previously part of their, their roles. Yeah, so resilience training can help in that respect. Absolutely. I guess um, I'd love to get Dean's thoughts on this because we, we kind of conceptualise these skills as essential skills, you know, in, for everyday life. You know, life can be quite stressful, even more so at the moment as we're navigating our way through COVID and then the, the beginning of this recovery in, in Australia anyway. Um, how do we equip our workers and our colleagues with skills and strategies that really protect their long-term mental health. You know, not that long ago, um, you know, when we look at the, the scope of safety, let's say, it would be unimaginable now to put a, a builder, for example, out on a building site without high vis and, and hard hats and the right type of boots. And I feel we really do need to be considering what are the essential skills that equip workers to protect their psychological health and well-being in exactly the same way? What do you think, Dean? What's your thought? Yeah, on no, I, I agree totally, Saib. And, and when I took over this role as head of mental health at Reuters, so Reuters is the world's largest news provider, two and a half thousand journalists around the world. Um, and I tried to make resilience a sort of a pillar of, and building resilience, a pillar of the support that we provided to all our journalists. And I was very lucky to be put in touch with Sive back in 2017 by Sam Harvey, who was the chief psychiatrist at the Black Dog. He said, you need to talk to Sive and, and, and she's, she's done some very interesting work around resilience training. And to be honest, at the time, I was not quite sure what resilience was. I thought, is this just one of these corporate buzzwords that, that companies are using? And, and uh, is it sounds like a bit of a box ticking exercise. Anyway, I read the research that, well, Saib was kind enough to show me the research before it had been published, spoke to her, and then we did a little trial with Reuters journalists using the, uh, the Raw Mind Coach program, which is now called Mind Armor. We did a trial with journalists in Sydney and Caracas. I thought, let's get two very different groups of folks in two very different places. And the result was the resilience of these folks was significantly improved. And then we rolled it out to all Reuters journalists around the world in 2018, and it was, and, and so this is across countries, across cultures, across different languages. And the beauty of this was that we were giving journalists something that they could, they, they could do 15 to 20 minute session about how to, how to control, um, not, not control, sorry, but how to, how to deal with thoughts that just pop into your head. Or my, my favorite one was how to deal with things that are outside your sphere of influence, which I think is really relevant in this, in this era of COVID-19, right? COVID-19 is outside our sphere of influence. We don't have control over what's happening with, with the pandemic, but it affects our lives. It affects our work lives, our personal lives. But so what, what we found with, this, um, with, with the Raw Mind Coach program, the Resilience Building program, was that it was able to help journalists I guess, be able to adapt, as I've said, to be able to adapt better to the circumstances that they found themselves in their working and, and personal lives. And it was so simple. And, and, and it could be done remotely as well. That was the other major benefit of it. Uh, and so what I was trying to do was to normalize the conversation around building resilience, that this was, we're not talking fruit bowls, we're not talking um, this sort of stuff that might just seem a little bit um, fluffy. But this is serious stuff. And, and the other thing with it was that 
I would keep drumming into people. You've got to keep doing this sort of stuff. You can't just do a, do a couple of sessions and then all of a sudden you're resilient. No. You, for example, I'm, I'm almost finished my fifth uh, time through, through the Raw Mind Coach, the Mind Armor program, because I think it needs to become a sort of a, a muscle memory thing where you, you keep training yourself on this resilience stuff so that it becomes instinctual. It just becomes embedded into your head. And, you know, when, it, when you talk about things are outside your, your sphere of influence, that is embedded in my head now. And, and if something, if I can't, if I've got no control over something, I just tell myself that's outside my sphere of influence. I can't control it. So just don't, don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. It's not worth wasting the energy over. There's been an interesting point that's come up in the, the chat box around, you know, like an individual's responsibility, but also a workplace's responsibility in terms of a, a hierarchy of keeping staff safe. Mm. Um, yeah, and I was wondering about that sense of, well, what's an individual's responsibility? What's the workplace's responsibility around resilience and, and safety and mental health well-being in the workplace? So I'll let you go first. Yeah, well, I would say, I think we're both on the same page with this, Dean, but we would consider this a shared responsibility. When you're, in terms of having a strong workplace mental health strategy, you know, our research team put out a, a really helpful paper in 2017 called A Framework to Creating Mentally Healthy Workplaces. And even back then, a resilience was definitely emerging in the literature as one of these proactive ways we can protect workplaces, workers' uh, mental health, so employees' well-being and mental health. But it's not done in isolation. So you can't, we can't um, deliver resilience training and, as Dean said earlier, treat it like a tick-the-box exercise and accept, expect everything to be A-OK -okay in a workplace, particularly if there's been issues with, um, you know, cultural issues going on or any... Um, problems in communication. We need to consider it as a quite a holistic approach to creating mentally healthy workplaces and resilience training does have a role to play. We also need to ensure that if we're delivering a program that the program A is evidence-based, that um, you as a workplace are hopefully collecting data to establish, well, is this particular training program useful for our workers in this organization? Because each organization may have its own unique stressors and challenges. But we're also um, keeping in mind that these other factors such as culture and um, organizational justice, for example, they also need to be addressed. So providing training is wonderful, but it needs to, they need, it needs to be put in context. And by that, I mean, you need managers and trainers to get behind it and hopefully complete the training and really mirror that behavior. We also are looking for um, managers and leaders to really highlight that it's okay to complete this training in the workplace and that that training is adequately um, acknowledged and recognized and that there are, I feel, adequate rewards given for people to complete additional training because that's what is happening. We're asking workers maybe to take time to do this training on top of their everyday, um, everyday role. Now, on that, you know, we can say, well, we expect our workers to do that. That's fine, but there's a lot to be said for really honoring the recognition role. So in the research, we know this forms a, what we call good organizational justice, which is a protective factor in itself. So we're ensuring that there isn't this effort reward imbalance that happens um, in someone's daily life when they're working, because when that happens, that actually becomes a risk factor for poor mental health in the workplace. So I'll just give a few examples. Um, you know, at Fire and Rescue, they've been running mindfulness challenges for with our program and they had uh, rewards such as going into a draw to win a Fitbit for those who completed the training, which was wonderful. We've had other organizations um, choose books from our recommended reading and award them at random to people who've completed the training. For emergency service groups we've worked with, they have provided professional development um, points for their people who, when they complete this training um, and even to give time and loo to complete the training as well. And Reuters did a, quite an interesting thing in terms of how they appropriately rewarded the training, um, Dean. Yeah, so this was, uh, and look, I'll be honest, back in 2018 when we introduced uh, Mind Armour, I actually couldn't get many people to do it. <laughs> Everyone was too busy or they just, um, it just, it just wasn't happening. And so I brainstormed with Sive, 
and uh, a few other people. And we came up with this idea of, well, what if we can give everyone a day off work who does the program? And to an American company, which is where Reuters is, Reuters American company was like, is this even gonna be possible? And um, to the company's credit, they agreed to this. And so the deal was, right, we'll have a, we called it a, a mindfulness challenge in May of last year and then also in October of last year. The deal was you do the 10, 10 sessions in Mind Armor and you get a day off work. And the response rate to that was extraordinary. Uh, over the two challenges, I think there were probably several hundred journalists who signed up and, and did, the, did the course, which, uh, and I gotta be honest, you know, journalists are, are, the most, um, are the most difficult people to sign, get to sign up to do any sort of course. Uh, they hate being told what to do, but the response was absolutely fantastic. And um, this, is the, this is what I was talking about with organizational justice, right? It's like the company saying, you do this training, we'll give you a day off work. And what I also did was I had a little bit of a budget. And so I allocated $250 um, for we have various regions that would be then allocated for people whose names were drawn out of a hat. And then that, that money was then available for them to spend on anything they wanted that had to do with self-care. So it was just a little incentives that uh, folks had and, and it really worked. Yeah, and it sounds like the organisation really has to get behind it and support it and yeah. promote it in order for it to be a real thing rather than just being something tick a box or tokenistic. Mm -hmm. Someone oh, yeah, we also, well, another thing on that, sorry, just to add as well yeah. is we, um, one of our, we have a, there was a big, uh, there's a big peer network at Reuters and, um, and I, I actually know, I, I saw her name pop up, Pauline Askin, who's a founding member of the peer network. She's in this, she's one of the participants on this call. She, um, she put together a, an amazing seven minute video of the, this the Mind Armour and she got a, one of our journalists from Caracas, one from New York, uh, had them film talking about how this training program had helped them. She got Saif to come into the Sydney newsroom to explain what it was all about what and what is resilience, right? She got Saif to just sort of break it down and explain what it is. And then got someone in New York to edit this thing together, seven minute, got some footage in. And it was just a fantastic way of explaining what uh, the program was, what resilience was and why um, it's, it's important. And I think those things together uh, really helped uh, basically uh, sort of cut through a lot of the, the myths that Saib was talking about earlier and presented in a way that was very easy for folks to digest. And then I, th I think that that really helped when it came to uh, just spreading the word and getting people to want to do it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So if we think practically, like what's the role of managers then, you know, if they're concerned about their teams and supporting them, trying to make decisions around coming back to the workplace after a period of working from home. You know, what can managers do in terms of res um, supporting the resilience of their, their teams? So <laughs> <laughs> This could be a whole webinar in itself. <laughs> um, I'll give you five minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I would say first and foremost, if you're, as a manager, do please check in on your staff. Uh, particularly now we're working from home. So if you have a regular um, time at the beginning or the end of the week to check in and see how they're doing, and in particular, those character, those people who, who are often seen as the most competent and who maybe have always managed to, you know, handle anything that's been thrown with them, they will often um, be the people that their colleagues will be turning to. So we need to check in on those people too. I would say it's important to have a good look out there to see as you're preparing for people to return to the workplace, whether the communication around the resources psychologically in the workplace are being communicated clearly. So ensure, even if it's you're, you're creating your own memo for your team, that could then actually be shared as a resource around your organization, but make it as simple as possible for your staff to understand where they can get support at this time, whether it's through peer supporters, if you have them, your EAP, whether it's chaplains, some workplaces have access to them, make sure that's clear and accessible and that you're communicating it regularly at, at, at the moment. I would say um, 
on that note, it is also considering what else can be done in the space as you're preparing people to return. So have a look out there through the Black Dog Institute, the Beyond Blue, the Heads Up, what training programs are available that can support your staff as they adjust to coming back if they're physically returning to the workplace or if they're still working remotely and how you're going to remain in contact during this time. But having those regular check-ins will be quite helpful. I would also say for managers is that you really do need to be checking in on yourself as a people leader. It's very easy for, um, I think, managers sometimes to be forgotten about because they are often looking out, out for their team. So be sure to check in on yourself, check in on your, your well-being and consider what can be done to really bolster your own well-being. Are there certain activities that you know really bring you back to you and really fill you, your cup and how can you make them a priority? But if you have fellow managers, this is where managers can almost be like their own peer support network that they can start to check in on one another. And that's very important right now because we've, ne we've, we've really haven't gone through something like this before. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. And Dean, any reflections on your role as a manager um, in terms of supporting a team? Yeah, well, actually, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's, some, there's some commonalities here. I mean, when, when uh, I was a senior manager, editor, we had a lot of journalists out in far-flung places, right? So in that sense, people were working remotely in, in very difficult locations. And, and I think the important thing is, is often when, when people are working remotely, they feel that pressure. And if I just give my my own exam, myself as an example, you would constantly feel like the editors are breathing down your neck. They want to know when that story's coming. They want to know when the next story's coming. And what I found so um, uh, encouraging was when editors would call and say, you know, how's it going? How are you doing? Um, and I remember one particular uh, time, it was during when I was covering the Boxing Day tsunami in Indonesia's Aceh province, which was a catastrophe beyond imagination and it was New Year's Eve and we myself and a team of a dozen others had been through death and destruction on an unimaginable scale and I got a call from our political editor from New York somehow reached me on a satellite phone and he just said I just want you to know just how much we all admire what you and all the team there are doing please tell them that we care about you all and, and, and look after yourselves. He got a list of every single person in all our countries around the Indian Ocean uh, and, and called, and just to pass on that message. And I think that's something that you can, as, and I've never forgotten that. And I think it's a wonderful sign, of, a wonderful example of leadership mm -hmm. and a wonderful example of just checking in. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be a big event like that. It's just, a, it's just being aware enough to know that Sometimes you just need to check in on people and you don't even need to talk about work. It might just be something like, have you got everything you need? And when people do come back to work, I know it was like coming out of, coming out of places like Iraq or these sorts of places. You wanted people to actually, uh, you wanted managers to say, how are you doing? You didn't want to just have to go in and sit down at a new desk and, and then be expected to pick up on a new story, a new whatever. You wanted to actually feel like people cared about you. So when people go back to work, if they do physically go back to work after being out remotely, I think managers need to say, uh, say to folks, how are you doing? And, and really mean it. Yeah, so it's, it's really, it's, it's human to human connection, isn't it? And um, unlike a lot of things that happen, this is happening to all of us and the mm. impacts, you know, affect individuals in different ways. So it's that checking in, in an individual way to find out how this affected this person and what can be done to support them. Yeah, there was yeah. a question, sorry. I was just going to just highlight that again too because I've worked for a long time in private practice with people and I'm always genuinely you know, moved when someone I'm working with shares that their manager checked in with them. Mm -hmm. Like they are, they. I cannot overemphasize how important that is and what a difference that makes to a worker who is struggling or who's dealing with stress or, or you know, whatever they may be unfolding for them at that point in time. Just that, that connection in itself becomes a protective factor 
in the workplace. And your your you know, and I would highlight too, if someone does go on leave unexpectedly, which could happen right now, you know, uh, please do check in with that person. That we know from the research that makes a very big difference to that person coming back or seeking the right help that they need in that at that point in time. And I'd also highlight here, if you are a manager or an emerging leader or manager and, you're, and you may struggle to have these conversations with people around how they're doing or they're okay, maybe it brings up um, a feeling of, of worry within you that I, I'm worried about saying the wrong thing or I don't know if I'm going to put this right, I don't want to make it worse for them. They're all normal, natural concerns because you do actually genuinely care. And I would say, it is your role as a manager now to perhaps look at the training that will support you in that role. And I know at the Black Dog, we have wonderful manager training to really help managers grow in their confidence to have these really important conversations with their, with their staff um, and having these check-ins because it can literally save lives for some people. And I think that, you know, it's came up in the chat box, but sometimes when we're running the manager training, people say, but I, I'm worried about doing the wrong thing. You know, should I, should I ring? Should I email? How should I do it? And I think it'll depend on your relationship with the person. But I, I genuinely feel that if it's done with goodwill and it's done with intention, um, you know, with a, with a good intention of checking in, then, you know, however it's done, it's often received in a good way because the intention's been pure. Absolutely. Um, and I think as long as you flag it with, I'm not sure the best way to reach out to you, but I really just want to check in with how you're going. I think that Absolutely. eases it. Yeah. yeah. And don't underestimate the power of being heard. I think every human being, we all know that feeling when we're sitting with a dear friend and or a loved one and they ask what, what Dean was saying, like, how are you doing? And we feel really heard. It's such a I mean, Chris used that phrase, the human, human, human to human contact. Like it's such a profound experience for us as human beings to feel really heard, but even more so when we've been struggling or when we've been having a tough time. And I can speak to that personally as well. You know, when you feel really heard, it allows a space to open that, you know what, maybe there's a path forward out of this. And managers, it's not their role to, you know, just know it's not your role to fix the situation in that moment. The role is just to hold space compassionately, openly, and then ask, as Dean had said, you know, is there anything that I can do to help out right now? Um, you know, we have these resources available. And I would say, you know, make, a, make an appointment with them there and then to check in on them a little later in the week. Would you mind if I if I check in on you in a couple of days time and see how you're doing that can make all the difference to um it certainly has for my clients and I've been working one on one of them to know that they have a manager who cares and that plans to check in on them in, in a few days time yeah great so it's that it's not just one conversation it's a, a number of conversations and a, and a regular checking in process so it's you also flagged earlier that you know managers need to look after themselves and that resilience is about what a workplace can offer, but also what individuals can do. So I'm just going to share the results of the poll around um, self-care. Um, yeah, and so we were interested in, you know, did how's COVID-19 impacted on the amount of time people mm. are allocating to self-care? Yeah, so I know, um, so I, this is one of your favourite topics. What are your thoughts around the, uh, the results of this poll? So allocating more time to self-care now is 40 percent so it's gone up a bit obviously for some people i would say it's really important for us as human beings to consider self-care as a resilient strategy mm. that it's an act of resilience that we as human beings our resilience will naturally fluctuate over time and as i said earlier during periods of prolonged stress we just know neurologically and physiologically that there's wear and tear on our minds and bodies so with that in mind what can we do to continuously um, honor self-care and replenish those internal resources and so i will, when i'm working one-on-one -on -one with people when people first come to see me if i'm doing one-on-one -on -one work we will review self-care right away. And you probably do this too, Chris. And what I do see is like, oh my God, self-care has gone out the window. It's just disappeared. And it, the, all the intention is there, but it's somehow in the corner. And all the other values of trying to be a good dad or a good mom or a great worker, or you know, be there for elderly parents who do work and that has all come to the forefront. And there's been a forgetting of the, the human being and the body that's here trying to do everything. 
And what I would say to that is self-care is your foundation. It is so important. And it's like what Dean was saying right at the beginning of the session, like he considers it paramount. Why that is, is that when we're taking care of our self-care and really, and by, by that I mean really taking a moment, and we might even do it here right now, if you take a moment and consider for you personally, because it's slightly different for each of us, what really fills your cup? What really nourishes you from the inside out? What brings you back to being you? So for my husband, it seems to be a lot of sports. You know, he needs his time out in nature, mountain biking. That's where he gets his natural mindfulness and playing volleyball, which he's going to do later on this evening. And for other people that may be meditating or yoga or spending time with friends or a combination of these, but it is important, you know, knowing them is one thing, but setting an appointment with yourself so that it is non-negotiable in your week is very important. This is where we get from moving away from self-care as being this, this fluffy idea, rather than it being really practical, that it involves action and it's in your diary and you're not going to compromise on that. That, that, that appointment is as important as an appointment you might have with a manager or a colleague or a friend. Um, so why is that important overall? You're replenishing your resources. And here's the thing, when you do that, you are then, every other value in your life can be honored from a space of feeling replenished, that you have the energy to do it rather than compromising on your own health and well-being. It can be a bit tricky for people to, to, to do this initially. And so know that that's quite normal and natural, but, but it can really hold space for you moving forward and honoring all your other values in life if self-care is really prioritized. And so it seems like, you know, a third of people in the poll were saying that their self-care um, has gone out the window. It's, yeah. um, they've forgotten about it, but about 40% have been prioritizing it. And is that what resilience looks like? Yeah. That in the face of difficult times, we go, right, I've really got to put more effort into this to resource myself. A hundred percent. And, you know, I'd love to highlight here that this kind of speaks to, um, our natural resiliency as human beings. I think we often underestimate our resilience. We do need to consider resilience like maintaining a garden. You know, it needs water, it needs sunshine. We need to be, re we need to be tending to that garden. But there's also uh, a lot of spontaneous growth that can happen in a garden. And so there's this insight that we have as human beings when we're going off, when we're going off balance a little and we need to recenter ourselves. And I would say, you know, from my work with people one-on-one, -on -one, people who, you know, people who have struggled with mental health difficulties, that is not exclusive to resilience. In fact, what I have learned over the years is some of the most resilient human beings I've met have struggled profoundly with mental health issues. They've been on this journey to actually understand what works for them resilience-wise, and then they start to honor it regularly. Because much like what Dean shared, if we don't honor it regularly, then we can actually start to suffer or our other values start to become impacted. I guess um, I'm just gonna highlight one thing here too, Chris, while I, while I have a captive audience, uh, <laughs> is not only is self-care never selfish, but there needs to be boundaries in place to really honor it. So that means, as you said, you know, making an appointment with yourself in your diary, ensuring you uphold that, even if that feels a bit awkward initially. But another element to this is, taking a mindful pause when people ask you to be involved in different things. And this can happen in the workplace too. So how do we pause and delay our yeses in a really gentle way with others? Because I've worked a lot with people in service to others work, emergency service workers, teachers, parents, and we can easily just give our time and energy away. Whereas if we pause to come back to our diary and say, is this going to compromise my self-care? What am I willing to sacrifice if I take this additional task on? Then we're more likely to get a picture of what's actually going to be workable for us, what's going to protect our resilience long term. And what does it look like for you, Dean? Like what? Um... Well, I think actually uh, saying no is an act of resilience. I think um, that's certainly something I've learned. But another thing that I've, I, I've learned, and I learned this in the psych ward actually, uh, something that I found really important for me, it's, it's setting my intention. It's setting my intention at the start of the day to practice self-care. It's setting my intention to go for a walk in the morning here in the middle of Tasmania when it's minus five, 
degrees and I'd actually prefer staying inside in the warm kitchen, thank you. And this, this, this emerged in the psych ward. It was a, a fantastic occupational therapist who would run these group sessions there. And so, this is a psych ward in Melbourne, um, mainly veterans, uh, coppers, ambos, and, and then the odd civilian journalist like myself. Or, and um, you know, these are pretty, apart from myself, sort of pretty tough people, you might say, um, from, the, from that sort of area of uh, first responders slash military. And this uh, occupational therapist would say to people, you need to set your intention. If you want to deal with your, everyone had post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So mm. if you want to deal with your post-traumatic stress, you need to set your intention to understand your anxiety, to understand your depression. You need to set your intention to learn to respond to a panic attack. And there was just something about those words, set your intention, that really stuck with me. So I got it tattooed on the inside of my right bicep so that I wouldn't forget it. Awesome. <laughs> but it just, it works. And so for me, setting my intention sort of goes side by side, resilience and self-care. It's just become my motto. And one that I find has, it's just been so helpful over the years. I think, you know, we're getting this sense of resilience is not a soft option, is it? It's quite a courageous uh, approach that requires us to set boundaries. It's and hard work. Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah. You know, I mean, you think of, I think you look at it, people should be thinking about resilience in the same way that they might look at training for a, a sporting event, training for a, a marathon, right, Saif? I mean, I think you've got to look at it that way, have, it, have, that, sort of, uh, have that sort of mindset, right? I would also say that uh, absolutely that there, you know, one of the wonderful phrases I I came across in terms of what we're doing when we're using specific strategies like mindfulness and self care and self compassion and cognitive skills is that we're recruiting our brain's neuroplasticity and training the brain to hold space for us and to respond in a, a really mindful resilient way to the situations we encounter versus reactivity and this is something that we do see over time in general in the literature on mindfulness training you know and what mindfulness can afford us when we just do very short practices so in our program that's one of the core skills we teach and it's really capitalizing on the brain's ability to lay down these new networks and we're that again another really short simple strategy even if you've never done any form of mindfulness training um i get a good example is taking a pause between emails or especially if an email has been has sparked something in you and going oh god that's a how am i going to respond to this can we take a mindful pause and do some simple mindful breathing it could be taking four or five slow deep breaths and what this actually does is it helps to regulate the limbic system and that part of the brain that can often go into overdrive and feel very stressed out and make us more reactive whereas if we take a few mindful moments it helps to ground us we gain clarity and we're more likely then to respond or uh, respond or choose an action that's in line with our personal values and who we truly are so that itself has been mindfulness is coming out as this core resilience strategy we can easily teach ourselves and our brains um, but also some of the self-talk, which I, I think, you know, we, Dean and I've talked about this in the past. This is where self-compassion comes in, really checking in on our thoughts. We have thousands of thoughts a day as human beings and not all are helpful. And I've had numerous clients share with me over the years, like what a helpful thing it is to know that not all your thoughts are actually that helpful. So if we can utilize mindfulness or even the ability to just kind of check in on our, our mind chatter. That's what I call it. You know, we have a lot of thoughts coming in and out of our minds every day. If we're getting stuck in certain thoughts, we can train ourselves to step back a little and say, you know, is this thought helpful? Is it useful to me? Does this help me take effective action in my life? And if not, just know it's just a thought that it's not particularly helpful. If it's something that's 
being persistent and it's hanging around and causing you a lot of distress, then that is something then that you can seek support on because that's where psychologists come in and EAP can be incredibly helpful in learning different skills and strategies to help manage stressful thoughts that hang around. And I would say on that, it's so important to understand that reaching out for support is actually, I mentioned this earlier, a resilient skill in itself. We saw that in our research that reaching out for support and even when we're doing our background research before the trial is that seeking support, we know the mental health benefits, but it actually also bolsters our internal resilience. Fantastic. And look, I've just re-put the slide up again, talking about all the different core mm -hmm. sort of resilience strategies and self-care being one of them, because um, someone in the chat box was asking, you know, does self-care, you know, equal resilience, but it sounds like resilience, there's a lot of factors that can contribute to it. A hundred percent. All of these factors, including our ability to, um, which is the last point that I haven't completely touched on here, but our ability to really understand our emotions when they emerge. Because the reality is we've grown up in a society where we weren't taught any of these skills in school. But thankfully now children who are growing up are in, in many countries in the world, they're being taught skills like mindfulness and understanding our brains and understanding our emotions. But we do have the ability to tap into using mindfulness with emotions or these strategies to understand why is this emotion emerging for me? And in our program, we teach a skill called creating space where we're really looking at, well, is there a value that's linked to this emotion and how can I offer my mind and my body compassion and space when it's processing this emotion so we can integrate it rather than run from it? And that might take a little time, but it's often the strategy that people, um, when we get feedback on our program, find the most helpful, this idea of like, well, we're emotional beings. We can't get rid of our emotions. We're complex and our emotions are quite, you know, even the painful ones, they're there for a reason. They help us interpret the world around us. So what happens if we can interact with our emotions in a really compassionate way and understand, well, is there something this motion is telling me about my personal values as a human being? That understanding about emotions and understanding ourselves as emotional beings is also a resilient skill. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Dean, there's a question in the chat box about um, are there any sort of resources or activities or that you can suggest to for greater clarity around setting intentions is there anything yeah and i'm just suggest? answering Stuart, yeah. and I, I just put my answer in there and i just sent it to the panelists which is no good so <laughs> i'm just going to try and cut and paste that so that everyone gets it um do you want to briefly speak that. to that yeah i mean basically i started out with a list um which uh i, I started out with a short list daily walk daily meditation, eat well, no booze, sleep well. And then I had set your intention at the top in capital letters. And then it just sort of, it just became embedded in my head. I didn't need the list anymore. And then of course I got the tattoo. So that helped as well. I wouldn't advise everyone to get a tattoo. That's, that's optional. Love it. Um, and I'm sure black dog probably wouldn't endorse something like that either. <laughs> but I think it's, it's what works for, it's what, it's what works for you. You find the, those words just work for me, but I think there's something pretty powerful about set your intention. And I'd, I'd be going for a walk, right? I'd be going on my daily walk and I'd be saying to myself, set your intention, don't eat sugar today. Or I go and do the shopping, set your intention, don't go down the confectionery aisle. And of course, the flip side to this is, and so I've talked about self-compassion, the flip side to all this is when you do go off the, the rails, which inevitably happens, you don't beat yourself up about it. So if you do have a, if you do have a night where you have a few rums or a few whiskeys, as I sometimes do, don't beat yourself up about it, right? You're only human. And, and so I think it's just, um, it's trying to develop good habits, trying to develop good routines, but no one's perfect. And I mean, I've got, I've got on my notice board here, I've got things like sugar equals premature death. So <laughs> I like to spell things out very clearly, okay? But I still eat sugar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Absolutely, yeah. It, it's just about trying to set good daily habits, and eating well is is one of those things that then feeds into resilience at the end of the day. I do think. 
I agree, Dean. I think it's honoring an intention is actually its own mindfulness practice on one level, but it's just allowing ourselves the flexibility to figure out what works best for us. And I know at the end of our program, we invite people to reflect on the journey they've been through all the different skills and strategies and self-care and self-compassion approaches, and they build their own action plan that's workable for them. Um, so that they, you know, that it is our own, that we know certain skills and strategies work, but it is important to make it personal for you. So you're honoring what works for you. Um, and I would share that one of my favorite resilience practices is what we call gratitude for the small things. Or, and it's something I learned when I was really struggling with burnout back in 2017 and joy felt very elusive to me. And I was coming across um, Tara Brack's work and Rick Hansen, who's a fantastic neuropsychologist, written some great books on joy and the power of joy. But how can we pause regularly to just note those really simple moments in life that we feel appreciative for. So whether it's a beautiful piece of music or a child's laughter or a gorgeous flower, or for me, it's like the crazy birds that you come across in Australia. They're very entertaining. How can we give our brains about 15 to 30 seconds to really be fully absorbed in that moment? It actually opens this pathway in the brain to joy, and that can really fill our cup from an optimism point of view, which is its own resilience skill. So I just thought I'd share that because I think it's something that we can easily start to tap into. And at the moment, given everything that's unfolding in our world, joy can feel a bit elusive, but there are these little ways that we can start to instill or reconnect with those moments we're truly appreciative of. And it can have this really positive knock-on effect for our well-being. Lovely, fantastic. And look, I hate to have to wrap the conversation up because it feels like we could keep going, but um, just a couple of things before we finish up. You know, we invite you to visit the Black Dog um, website for more information and resources about workplace mental health. Please download our mental health toolkit for managers. And you can also sign up to our COVID email, which has a weekly update on all new targeted resources. We'd also encourage you to have a look at the Heads Up website for free evidence-informed resources for business managers and employees. And in terms of resources for yourself, please um, have a look at Raw Mind Coach, which is an e-learning program that was developed by Scythe and has a lot of evidence behind it to boost resilience and enhance mental wellbeing. Also, we'd encourage you to have a look at the Black Dog Institute online clinic where you can get a free mental health assessment tool to check in to see how you're traveling and with resources recommended especially to help you. Also, This Way Up online um, has online treatment programs for anxiety, depression, and physical health. And you can also contact your employee assistance program and see what other resources are available in your workplace. Thank you so much. This has been such a rich and interesting conversation. Thank you to Saiv and to Dean. It's been fantastic to meet you and to hear about your journeys and the really interesting work that you both are doing. And um, thank you to our audience. Thank you for actively engaging with us in this topic in the chat room. And it's been really interesting to hear from you. So please join us for the third part of our series, which is looking at managing job insecurity in insecure times and what this means for our mental health. As we finish up, um, a evaluation will pop up on your screen. It'll only take a few minutes. So please complete that survey for us. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you again at our next uh, webinar. Thank you, Saiv and Dean. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. I'm glad everyone could. Thanks to everyone who took part. It's a really important issue. Yeah, fantastic.